I just have a um, um, brief presentation sort of um, describing what sort of storage problems we have. Britt, I can't hear you. Did you mute your microphone again? Somehow it muted itself. So can you hear me now? Yes. Good. I don't know how, why my audio was gone. Um, I have one theory. Um, I was going to say, um, my presentation is going to be a, a sort of an overview of what our storage challenges are and um, where they're coming from and um, how we're trying to, um, what, what, what implementations we have to, to try and address them. Um, and as I'm not entirely familiar, sure how m many people are fully familiar with Diamond, uh, here's a brief overview. Um, Diamond Lazos is the UK's National Synchrotron Facility. We are located at the Harvard Science and Innovation Campus in Oxfordshire. We are a electron synchrotron. We use the electrons that are going in a circle um, to generate light or various description from infrared to X-rays. We have uh, about 30 operational beam lines, um, other detectors, we have uh, the UK's, we're also hosting the UK's um, electron microscope facility. So we have a number of electron microscopes that are also pretty much using the same infrastructure, but they're not obviously not using the um, electrons. They have their own sources um, for their detectors. Um, our users and our scientists, they typically want to have really, really fast feedback on, on the quality of the data for the experiment planning. Uh, working out if um, they're hitting the right sample, if their sample, their crystal or whatever they're looking at is good enough to decide whether or not they want to continue taking data with that or if they want to move on to the next one. And that drives some of our um, storage requirements. Um, so our storage is definitely shared use for data acquisition, for the processing of the, dis the, uh, the uh, data. Um, for the visualization, um, our scientists want to see the data directly. They do things like typing ls into the directory where the data is collected, um, just to see if that that the data actually appears on, on disk. Um, for processing, we have some high performance computing, or maybe you call it high throughput computing, because we rely, some of our processes rely heavily on having many jobs go through very fast. Uh, so our scientists want to see the data on their desktops. That brings NFS and SIFS as a requirement. We have Linux and Windows desktops. We have some Macs. Um, and because we need to control who can see what data, depending on who done the experiment, we have some fairly complex access control issues. Um, um, and they drive some of the issues. Um, in terms of data acquisition, the source of our data um, that is being written to the file system, we've got a large number of different detectors and pretty much each of those detectors has some of special some special issues. Um, but broadly you can you can divide them into two classes. Uh, one class is sort of writing individual files per scan or even per frame. Um, the files can be all sorts of formats, but typically um, they can, some of them write hundreds of files per second, um, sustained for a long time. Uh, the other class of detectors is sort of, um, from a storage perspective, more well behaved. They write a smaller number of larger files, typically HDF5. Um, and yeah, our file systems have to provide both. One example of a detector that um, has given us grief in the past is, is a pilates detector we've, that we've used. I have 
used pretty much exclusively on uh, for crystallography and for their use case they write six megabyte files at about 100 hertz 120 hertz sometimes and they continue doing that for half an hour or so uh, so 10,000 files for data collection in a single directory is that definitely not uncommon um, unfortunately our scientists then also want, sometimes have multiple data collections in the same directory even though we tell them that this is not a good idea um, but they still do it um, second problem for these types of experiments is that they really there what some of the experiments where uh, the fast feedback within a few seconds knowing what the result is, is is really important so they the latency from collecting the data on the detector to having the data available on our on our high performance compute cluster is is a really big um, issue there um, and because we don't have control over the detector itself we have some custom tools that copy the data from the detector to the file system um, some of our issues that we've seen there relate to the large number of directories in a file and if you repeatedly call RAS arson even if you give it the name of the file that it needs to copy it still does a stat on the destination and therefore it starts to slow down and and uh, our users have start complaining and, and we, we we kept going well the file system is fine we it was really hard to debug and eventually we, we realized that actually the fact that we're using rsync um, was causing us problems we switched that to something else we're basically doing copy and uh, then a check um, removing the need to start the files on the destination separate the crystallography people have upgraded their detectors mostly um, to some uh, something called Iger again from Dectris um, and there the data rates have increased the the, the um, frequency at which they take frames have increased but at the same time we've done some work and we've um, switched all of those to basically writing HDF5 files the detector sends the data over zero MQ to some machines that are close to the file system uh, and we write about depending on the compression for the data three to five gigabytes per HDF5 file about a thousand frames um, and they run they are th these thousand frames they run at about 500 Hertz so that's about two gigabytes sustained um, and they can run that for a long time um, in this case to to help with uh, actually uh, to help with the low latency and so we don't have to wait for the whole file we use a feature for HDF5 called swimmer which basically is the implementation to allow one single writer and multiple readers problem there for us was that um, that requires on some locking so NFS is not um, good enough so we need to uh, have all the machines that are involved in that including all the readers to be native native GPFS uh, clients which causes some issues sometimes um, but another detector that um, can drive us um, crazy is um, used for tomography mostly PCOH cameras the drivers for those cameras are windows only uh, or at least have been windows only for a long time and they only uh, talking to our scientists the only dri drivers that are stable enough for them to be useful are on windows so we have uh, windows machines that generate a gigabyte per second of um, data um, it originally mostly written in, into TIFF images um, of again about 10 megabytes of a file um, more recently we've we've switched them and they're mostly writing HDF5 files um, but again because it's tomography they can continue running the same experiment for for hours and a um, hundred gigabyte or more per collection is is not that infrequent and sometimes they write really large put all of that into one single HDF5 file um, and that's great for IO most of the time but at the same time it does mean we can't optimize our file systems for the smaller files that we had on the other detectors because we also have quite a few detectors writing larger files um, once the data is collected 
we then process the data on the cluster. Uh, many nodes are reading the data in parallel, um, and some of the processes um, insist on starting all the files um, to make sure that they're so they're actually on the file system. Um, so start start rates and read rates are very important on that side, um, and overall, it's just as typically for HPC, it's it's basically lots. So we have quite a large number of CPU nodes, and, and um, typically our file systems, um, we optimize them for write performance because that's what the detectors um, care about. But at the same time, when you actually look at it, the read rates typically are a factor of five or 10 higher than the write rates. So um, that's what our file systems have to deal with. Um, at the same time, while all of that is going on, as I said earlier, the scientists want to see their data. They sit at their workstation. They want to look at their data, possibly typing LS, um, as in the as I described as the impatient scientist. Um, it's something that they have been doing when the detector, typically a Pilatus detector, creates all the files. They then run LS on their workstations and um, then call us up when LS takes 60 seconds to complete. Um, the particular slide is, is describing a problem that we've had with the GPFS and CES. So I'm um, taking that from a different one. It's not currently a problem that we've seen with the uh, plus 60 seconds, but it's it's a typical it's it's a something that happens on our file systems and we need to deal with. Um, what file systems do we have? Given that we've had the one gigabyte per second uh, single stream, single process writing into a single file requirement for a few years now, um, back then GPFS was the only file system that we rely, f found that was easily able to do that um, at a large scale. So we have chosen GPFS a few years ago, and by now we have three separate GPFS file systems. Uh, one data center has currently has two file systems, and the newer data center has the third file system. We try to have all clients um, on our file systems writing via IB or accessing the files from via IB because we found that um, that makes them more resilient with the lower latency and, and um, lossless networks and all that. But given the fact that all our clients are distributed over, over the whole building um, and are physically quite far away from our data centers, we have to have Ethernet clients. Um, the mix of Ethernet and IB is sometimes proving challenging. The fact that Ethernet is not a lossless network can cause problems for GPFS. So that's um, some of the things that we struggle with at times. Um, and that was pretty much a brief overview of our challenges. Any questions? Thanks for sharing. So are there any questions? From the audience. So I have a question regarding the software. Um, you mentioned also that you use the some software for HDF5, right, on these uh, Windows machines. And is this self-created software or is it proprietary from the vendors? Uh, that part is um, de de developed by our controls group, and I think it's it's uh, it's based on Epix as the um, controls part, um, and it's uh, well. There's certainly some development by people at Diamond. I don't think they're the only ones, and it, it's definitely open source. Um, it's area detector from the Epics 